Uh, welcome. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction and also the invitation to come here. It's really enjoyable uh, here in Vienna uh, with you. Um, today, I will be talking about um, organic electrochemical transistors. Um, many people here are using organic electrochemical transistors mainly for, for sensing purpose. Um, this is also something we are doing in my group. Uh, but we are also working on, um, on neuromorphic computing. That means exploring the weird properties of these devices to some sort of intelligence. Um, this goes in the direction of what, what Eric has just said. So complex transient behavior of these devices. Um, and that's what we're doing. And it's a very uh, hot topic at the moment in the community. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment. Oh, this doesn't work anymore. Um, there's a lot of work going on at the moment where uh, people are trying to, to use OECTs uh, for, for uh, edge computing applications. So this is one example from, from William Thunderbolt and Adato Saleo, where they've used uh, organic memoristic devices integrated into passive matrix, uh, active matrix arrays uh, to carry out uh, vector matrix multiplication on a flexible substrate. They can treat the uh, connections uh, between the individual nodes of the network quite precisely. So it's actually what you need to carry out vector matrix multiplication. Then there's some, some other work from, um, from Max Planck in Mainz or from Pashalis, uh, who is using the, the fact that OECTs are always communicating with each other through the electrolyte. So you can use um, regulation, global regulation mechanisms as they also uh, happen in the brain uh, for neuromorphic computing. And then there's also some, some work from my group. Uh, we are working on these so-called physical reservoirs where you're using the non-linearity of certain nodes uh, to transform uh, information in a, into a higher dimensional space, which makes it much easier uh, for classification. And originally I was planning to present today some work on our heartbeat classification used on uh, stochastic computing, uh, but I decided to switch the topic a little and talk a bit more about the origin uh, of the neuromorphic uh, properties of OECTs that we see. And just to have everyone uh, on board, I'm going to briefly repeat how an OECT actually works. Um, we have you know, the normal elements, so a source and a drain electrode. We have a, a semiconductor material, which is usually uh, a polymer material that swells if you dip it into a, a water or a polar solvent. And the semiconductor is able to, to transport ions as well as, uh, as electrons and holes. And if you put a droplet of, of electrolytes or water with NHCl, for example, on top of that, you see that ions might penetrate into the semiconductor, so the semiconductor swells, and ions can get into this. And uh, this is the material system we are using. It's a benchmark material system. It's PLPSS. Probably uh, most of you have seen this before. Uh, we have the uh, ionic part, which is the, the PSS unit. You have a negative charge here uh, on this side, and this negative charge um, introduces a positive charge to the polaron on the, P, uh, on the P dot, which is able to move uh, along the backbone and you create electrical conductivity of the system. What happens now, if you uh, put a third electrode into the system, like a gate electrode, and you apply potential to the gate electrode, you, for example, remove cations from the system, from the, from the polymer, uh, and collect them via the gate electrode. And this is also what happens in P dot PSS. So you are using, for example, um, a sodium cation here to neutralize um, the SO3 minus, thereby taking the polar road away from the semiconductor and the P dot uh, becomes conductive. So, this is how it looks like in reality in our labs. Um, uh, we're doing this by inject printing techniques. So, we are uh, defining source, drain, and gate electrodes by uh, conventional photodetography. And then we're using an um, inject printing process to print the P dot PSS in the channel. So, this is the, the tiny channel area. And the colorful thing you see here on top of that um, is a printable solid state electrolyte we're putting on top of that. And this is a typical um, transfer curve uh, that we obtain from these transistors. Um, a very nice transistor in principle, very low uh, driving voltage. You have a nice off state, very low current, and a nice on state um, with high current. And in between, we see a couple of features that are quite appealing for uh, neuromorphic computing. Uh, in particular, uh, there is a huge um, hysteresis. And uh, very surprisingly, if you look at the models that are available for OECTs, um, no one is talking about it. It doesn't exist. They're using basically an FET model based on, yeah, basically the equivalent circuit model. Say, okay, we can more or less model the transfer characteristics, but completely ignoring all the dynamic effects and hysteresis. So it's a very unsatisfying situation if you want to start doing something on your remote computing because there's no model available. So we ask ourselves the question how we could uh, approach this. And uh, if you look a bit more deeper, actually, there are many other features in OECTs, uh, the models that that don't fit to what we see in our experiments. And this, this is just one part. Uh, in addition, we also see the fact that 
uh, in the transfer characteristic, uh, the current saturates. So there's a saturation and transfer curve, which is completely unusual. No one would expect this from an OECD, but no one is talking about this in the literature. That's very surprising. So, and so we started looking at the different um, the transient properties of OECDs rather than uh, looking at the static IV curves. Uh, and they are very, very surprising things. Uh, for example, we did a very simple experiment at the beginning. Uh, it just looked at the shape of the transfer curve depending on the, on the sweep rate of the voltage. You usually would expect if you have some hysteresis, which is because of charging or trapping effects, um, if you scan reasonably slow, it should completely disappear. But most surprisingly is even if we scan with a speed of a few microvolt per second, it always remains. We can even wait for, for years, uh, it always remains kind of hysteresis. So in fact, we are not talking about the hysteretic behavior, but it's a combination. So we have hysteresis, which happens on the time scale of a few seconds, but also a bi-state operation in the system. Uh, and this is exactly what, what Erika also mentioned. We have, yeah, uh, complex processes on, on very different time scales going on, which is important um, for our brain. Um, because we have long-term plasticity, short-term plasticity, and all these other effects. And one other um, interesting fact we, we stumbled um, uh, on when we did very primitive measurements on these devices is we looked with a thermal camera uh, on the devices and just checked, okay, how the device is performing, whether we see some hotspots appearing. And what was very surprising to us was to see that um, in the off-state, so no current running through the device, the device was at uh, 25 degrees C. If you turn on the device and have lots of current through it, really milliamps, it cools down. And this is completely odd because you would expect this dual heating device should get hot. In fact, it's cooling down. So there's something very weird going on in these devices and it needs uh, further explanation. And that was the starting point uh, for us to look at um, the thermal properties of uh, organic electrochemical resistors and also to develop a thermodynamic model um, of organic electrochemical resistors. And most surprisingly, in literature, we couldn't find any publication where people have looked at temperature dependent of OECDs. Um, doesn't exist. And uh, I think the, the very simple answer to that is, um, well, if you have water, what are you going to do? You cool it down, it freezes. If you heat it up, it goes away. So it's, it's not a very nice uh, experiment because everything's going to change over time. Um, and, and luckily, we have a system where we have a solid state electrolyte, which even works in, in vacuum environment or glass box. So it's a modest dry system. So what I mentioned before, we are, we are uh, patterning by photolithography, the gate electrode, source electrode, and drain electrode. We print on PLOT PSS, um, an inject printing process. And then we use um, this component here, which is our solid state uh, electrolyte, which we can print on top of that and cross link it afterwards uh, by UV, uh, UV radiation. And in principle, it's a perfectly dry system. We can operate this in glass box or vacuum. And it allows us to vary the temperature between minus 60 to plus 100 degrees C. So we can really carry out temperature different measurements. This is a typical example of one of our devices, which we have encapsulated with Parilin. Uh, I think this has been measured for more than uh, four weeks, uh, 10 loops. You see it's, it's perfectly stable, so we can ensure that nothing is going to change um, on these devices over time. And here is the, the simple uh, result of our very first measurement. Uh, you see uh, um, the temperature dependent behavior of an OECT, uh, and there are a couple of features you can immediately see. So first of all, if you cool down the system, the hysteresis uh, greatly increases. Maybe not very surprising, but uh, we see there's a lot of physics uh, behind this process. So the more we see that the on current goes down, there's also something we can possibly explain. And one other thing which is also very surprising for us is that if you heat the, sub uh, the material, the subthreshold scope is getting steeper. Very puzzling to us. I think. So let's look a bit more detail uh, into this. So this is the transconductance of a no ECT with temperature. Um, yeah, if you cool down the system, it decreases slightly, which is something more we can accept. Uh, looking at topping like transport in this material, usually the, the conductivity of such a system goes down. But it's actually a very weak um, um, uh, process compared to other semiconductor materials like a layer of fantasy. If you put it down by, by 40 degrees C, you would significantly uh, lose conductivity of the system. The more interesting thing was uh, to look at the, at the hysteresis. And we originally thought that um, the entire hysteresis is just caused by an RC delay because ions are moving along the electrolyte and charging up the system slowly, they are stored in the electrolyte. So we just studied the, the impedance response um, of the gate electrode, just to see whether this is the same time constant. And what we can see is, so if we cool down the system, we have an RC time delay here of about um, uh, 10 to the one minus uh, one hertz, so about um, 10 seconds at low temperature. Uh, if we increase the temperature, it goes to uh, the range of um, 10 microseconds. Um, that's surprising because this time scale doesn't explain the hysteresis we find in our experiments. 
In fact, we are scanning the devices with a speed that is six orders of magnitude slower than the time constant we have here. In particular, even if we heat the device up to 100 degrees C, the hysteresis never disappears. So that's the reason why we call it a bi-stability um, of the devices. And we were looking for a model to explain this, and this comes uh, on the next slide. One other um, interesting thing that I also mentioned before is we determined the subthreshold slope uh, from these devices. And uh, very surprisingly, if you increase the temperature, the subthreshold slope goes down. Um, if you believe in Fermi Dirac statistics, uh, this should not be the case. So it's a very, very surprising behavior. And um, I said, there's nothing in the, the literature you can find where people explain this. So we ended up with, with um, more questions than, than answers that, than we had. So we had a bi-stability of the material. We had a very high subthreshold slope, which is even uh, improving if we heat the device. Um, uh, the, the channel is, is, is cooling down if we run a lot of current through it and many open questions. So we said, okay, now we have to, to do some physics to study really the mechanisms behind that. And this brings us to um, the thermodynamic model that I would like to present to you. And with the next slide, I don't want to scare you. That would be a couple of equations. Um, this is just for the sake of completeness. I will stop doing that and then just only show plots illustrations of what's going on. But we have to do that. So we started with the uh, most basic equation, which is the uh, redox chemical reaction equation of uh, P dot PSS. So we have the conductive state of P dot. So here's the polaroid. Uh, there is the, the PSS minus. And if you have a sodium uh, inside the system, it neutralizes uh, the PSS minus and the P-dot gets, gets zero. That's our starting point. So we can uh, translate this into to math by using, for example, a parameter phi, which represents the concentration of neutral P-dot species. Since this is a complete system, uh, there's a balance between the, the neutral P-dot and the charged P-dot. So the sum needs to be one uh, in principle. And now we um, probably heard it yesterday evening, there was a, a famous guy from Vienna uh, called Ludwig Holzmann, um, who developed the, the fundamentals of thermodynamics. And we applied his theory in, um, in chemist, uh, uh, theoretical chemistry. This is called uh, the plugging uh, um, potents model. So you have written down uh, the Gibbs free energy as a, as a sum of the enthalpy plus the entropy of the system. And uh, to begin with, we completely ignored this uh, enthalpic term, which is uh, accounts for interaction between different ions. So the Coulomb repulsion, for example, between anions uh, and anions or uh, attraction between anions and cations. So we treated this at the beginning as an ideal gas. That means we're ignoring this. <laughs> we, come, we come to it later. Um, and if you have this ideal gas situation, you can do exactly what Boltzmann did. That means you're representing the entropy just by the probability of finding a certain species. So this is the most fundamental uh, equation you can, you can use to model this thermodynamic system. And in addition, you have some, some uh, constants which determine the equilibrium of the uh, uh, purely doped or the purely undoped state. Um, and this equation is quite unhandy. So uh, we just plotted this to illustrate how it really looks like. Um, and this is our function now, our function, uh, the Gibbs free energy uh, versus our concentration of charges in the system. And you can see it has this kind of parabola shape. Uh, we have here the insulating state of the p-dot and here the conductive state of the p-dot. We have determined the constants um, of the Gibbs free energy by measuring uh, the p-dot in the eye water and a salt concentration versus temperature. So we can, we know um, this boundary condition here. And already from this very simple um, model, there are a few um, interesting conclusions we can draw. For example, going from here, from the insulating state uh, to the conductive state, well, there is a, the, the change of positive, uh, of uh, free energy is positive. Of this. That means that <coughs> a reaction. So the system has to cool down to some extent. So it's something that immediately comes out from the thermodynamic theory. Furthermore, you see here the prediction from our model, what is going to happen if we cool down the system. The Gibbs free energy, the minimum of the Gibbs free energy is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. That means uh, there's a higher thermodynamic driving force to get out of the minimum of the system, which means also the subthreshold of the system should become steeper. So it's a very simple conclusion um, from, from this model. And uh, the question is now how to get from this Gibbs free energy to the ID curve. This is our final goal to have a model for the, for the transient behavior. Um, and luckily also Boltzmann did something uh, here in, the, in this regard. Um, you can use the Gibbs free energy and just put the derivative of the Gibbs free energy to get the chemical potential of the system. That's all you have to do. We end up with this equation, uh, which I can also plot here. 
uh, it looks like this. So this is our mechanical potential versus uh, the number of charges we have in the system. There's again the insulating state uh, and the conductive state. And you see here the different shades of orange are basically different colors, um, uh, the different temperatures um, of the system uh, for our simulation. And um, if you have the, the mechanical potential, actually you know everything about the system. Because in principle, the chemical potential is something we can change by applying a gate potential. We control the chemical potential in the channel. As long as the source drain voltage is small, it's also uniform, just applying a gate potential. And the number of uh, uncharged P dot is basically proportional or one minus uh, the property um, uh, of the current that we have, because it's a number of charges. So using just a drift model of transport, meaning a uh, number of charges times a constant mobility, we can translate this quantity into the current and this quantity into our gate voltage. So in order to get the IV curve, we just have to turn around the plot, 90 degrees C, and that's our IV curve of the device. Uh, so we have uh, also here uh, a conductive state, here an insulating state of the pilot, and in between some very steep switching. And also here you can see a couple, uh, one, one very obvious thing that immediately comes out from our model, there is a saturation in the transfer curve. If we increase the gate voltage, the current will saturate. And the explanation behind that is pure thermodynamics. There's just a limited number of states available. That's something that usually never considers in the OTFT because there are many states available and capacitance is usually low. But here, it's really the case that every pilot is charged. It's going to separate. So um, yeah, so we can, with the simple model, explain many things. The C power subthreshold with lower temperature, saturation, and current. Unfortunately, we cannot really describe um, at the moment um, uh, uh, the bistable behavior. In order to do this, we have to make the, uh, the entire model a bit more complex. So and this is uh, just a comparison with experimental data. Here you see a typical IV curve, experimental IV curve from our devices for different source drain voltages. Um, the white line is basically a fit with a standard uh, FAT model or the Bernard's model that people are using. And it fits more or less okay, it gives you a slope and gives you uh, the threshold voltage, but doesn't work very well. With our simple ideal gas model, we already get a much better fitting to this. If we now include the interaction between anions and cations, so the enthalpic part of interaction um, becomes much better. We get a perfect fit of the system by including this uh, enthalpic uh, expressions um, of the ion interaction. So how did we do that? Um, also with the, with the most simple approach you can imagine, uh, we just expressed the uh, enthalpic mixing by first order reaction equation. So it's just a scaling parameter for the energy. This is the interaction between uh, neutral species this is the interaction between anions and anions, and this is the interaction between anions and cations. This is the first order uh, approach to, to describe a reaction. And if you plug this into your equation, immediately we get from this simple parabola shape to this kind of shape. So we get two minima out of that. Uh, again, here we have this uh, insulating state here with the conductive state, and in between we have uh, two new minima. And if you're applying a gate voltage, for example, to, to go from one to the other state, in principle, you should follow this line because it's describing the thermal uh, equilibrium. However, you have to be careful because the Gibbs free energy is, is not really the only condition to have the thermal equilibrium. Because here in this part, you have the situation that the slope or the curvature is actually in the wrong direction. Uh, so if you look at the chemical potential, it should be uh, constantly increasing uh, with the charge carrier density, but here there's a negative slope. That means what the system is going to do if you're ramping up the gate voltage going from here to here to here, you go up to this maximum here, and then you go straight and go up here. The same goes if you go the way back, you go up to here and then straight like this, because in between, this is not, a, not considered to be a stable point, so a part of the thermal equilibrium. And this is exactly what we see also in the experiment. So this is our theoretical turf uh, without the uh, um, uh, enthalpic mixing. And here you see the prediction from our system. Well, if the system is exactly at this point, it's too steep, and we go up to the other branch, and the same happens on the way back. So we can explain the hysteresis, but it's not hysteresis, it's by stability of the system because it comes out from the thermal equilibrium uh, of this device. And uh, here's a, an experimental result just to confirm that. Um, you see the device that you just saw at the beginning of this presentation. So we ramped up the IV curve. Um, up to this point and stayed here at zero volt uh, on the upper branch of the device. That's exactly this 
uh, condition here. And you can see that the voltage drops rather quickly um, on the time scale of a few milliseconds. That's a typical RC time effect. Then there is another time component on the time scale of about 10, um, 10 seconds. So there's some sort of longer term um, yeah, RC time probably because of ion strapping. And then it completely separates, it's flat. If we now program the device, we go up to, I think, 0 point, uh, minus 0 0.5 volts, then we go down on this branch, we stay here. And the same thing happens. So you discharge quite quickly, you lose some current, but then the device saturates and you have a stable gap between the two states over a long time. So we tested this for more than 10 to the power of seven uh, seconds. It's, it's perfectly stable. So it's really a bias stability and the entire transient behavior of the devices needs to be described by a composition of RC time effects, maybe also some more complex longer term things and this bias stability behavior. So overall, um, this thermodynamic model also it seems quite quite simple. It can give us already many, many uh, insights. So it can explain the saturation and transfer curve, the fact that um, the temperature in the channel becomes lower if we turn the device um, on because of the chemical reaction. And it explains also the unusual sub-threshold behavior the device is getting steeper if we increase the temperature. Um, furthermore, if we include um, into the model the, uh, the enthalpic mixing of the system, we also get actually out the, uh, the bias stability of the system. And this is really a consequence of the fact that we have two uh, minima uh, in the Gibbs free energy. And yeah, the entire behavior of the OCT needs to be described by more complex mechanisms accounting for the RC time um, effects of the gate electrode, as well as um, the bias stability that we see uh, because of thermodynamics. And that's what we are doing at the moment. So our next steps are we are applying this method vice versa. At the moment, we started with the model and try to fit our data. Uh, now we are just taking data and try to extract the parameters um, uh, from, uh, for the specific materials in order to find out uh, which properties of the polymer, so the, the conformation, the uh, yeah, thickness of the device can really actually influence uh, the parameters of the Gibbs uh, free energy that, that we have to be able to tune uh, the strengths of, um, of the hysteresis and the RC time effects. And uh, the, the next step for us is, and that goes also in the direction of what Eric said, we're using the stochasticity um, uh, of spiking neurons. And uh, we're using Müller C elements in order to determine then, uh, for example, make predictions on uh, hot beat conditions uh, using uh, Bayesian interference. And this is something we are doing also with this electrochemical resistors, exactly employing the fact that we bias the um, operation of these devices. Okay, with that, I'm already done. I would like to acknowledge uh, many people. Uh, this is yeah, Lucas who did his first uh, temperature dependent measurement. And this is Sidi who is preparing all these um, devices. And this is uh, Matteo, um, who is actually uh, the genius behind this thermodynamic model. Uh, we just developed this in, in one week during the corona crisis. We just sit together. Uh, and uh, it was a very good student. He's now in, uh, in uh, Geneva. And um, yeah, I really acknowledge his work here. And, of course, I would also like to thank you for your kind attention. I'm open to questions.